next session. Um, explanation and justification in AI will be moderated by Philippe Andre Rodriguez. Um, Philippe is the Deputy Director of the Centre of International Digital Policy at Global Affairs Canada and a Professor of Practice at McMaster University. He has many distinguished accomplishments and has written in many journals as well. Um, I won't dig into them all, but I will say that we are very lucky to have him attend with attend today in this role on such short notice given um, Jillian's absence. So Philippe, over to you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I hope you can hear me uh, properly. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm uh, very, uh, I'm, I'm really trying to keep uh, kind of an academic and a practitioner hat. It's not always easy, but thank you so much uh, for inviting me to moderate this panel and uh, and to be part of this uh, this really uh, incredible conversation. And just hearing this this previous panel, so many overlaps with with a lot of conversations that are happening at, at the international level. So uh, really great to see. Um, I'd like also to start just, uh, and I'm sure it was mentioned before, but today in Canada is National Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and would really encourage everyone to take time today to reflect not only on Indigenous history and, and struggles uh, in Canada, but also on the shared future of, of our societies. And obviously, you know, talking about digital tech and talking about the kinds of governance mechanisms uh, we want is, is definitely part of those shared futures. Um, now to go more specifically to this session, um, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about uh, the data aspect, but uh, more broadly in, in the context of this session, uh, modern machine learning systems are often large and complex, making it difficult to understand why they do what they do. Uh, the so-called black box uh, problem, as, as, uh, as has been called by Frank Pasquale and others, uh, raises challenges when AI systems are used to make or contribute to important decisions. Uh, including medical treatments, uh, which one to adopt, whether to grant bail to someone pending criminal trial, uh, or how to distribute public benefits. The call for AI to be quote unquote explainable has thus been mounting for several years. And in some jurisdictions, in some contexts, a right to explanation is begin beginning to appear in proposed legislation governing AI. In my personal work, I have seen this uh, make its way to a lot of international documents and processes whether it's at UNESCO, OECD, the Council of Europe, um, obviously in the European context in the EU, uh, or even at the UN General Assembly, uh, among other places. Um, these multiple calls have really spurred computer scientists to develop methods to provide accounts of what factors produce or influence an AI decision. But are such accounts the only kinds of explanation we need if AI is to play a significant role in our societies? Is it really explanation that is valuable or do we actually are, uh, seek to have justification? We look for justification from decision makers such as judges and regulators, uh, an account of the reasons that show that the decision is consistent with governing rules and principles. What insights might we gain about how to build trustworthy and accountable systems from what we know about justification in legal and regulatory domains? Uh, today, to discuss this, this important topic, we have two really stars, uh, two great uh, uh, panelists that are going to discuss this. Uh, first, we have Finale Doshi Veles, who is a Gordon McKay Professor in Computer Science at the Harvard Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, uh, she completed her MSc from the University of Cambridge as a Marshall Scholar, her PhD from MIT, and her postdoc at Harvard Medical School. Her interests lie at the intersection of machine learning, healthcare, and interpretability. She has published and lectured widely as a co-founder, organizer, and past president of the Machine Learning for Healthcare Conference and a recipient of an NSF Career Award and Sloan Fellowship. So really interdisciplinary at core, which is great for this conference. And then we'll hear, and I'll introduce both now, uh, Boris Babbitt, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics and Department of Philosophy at the University of, of Toronto, a faculty affiliate uh, at SRI, and a, vis a visiting professor in the Decision Sciences Department at, at INSEAD. Uh, his research interests are in Bayesian inference and decision making, normative questions in the implementation of AI and machine learning. He received a PhD in philosophy, uh, and MS in statistics from the University of Michigan and a JD from Harvard Law. 
school. So another uh, really in interdisciplinary uh, expert. Uh, and so I'm really pleased to, uh, to uh, introduce first Finale for uh, her presentation. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks so much for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. So um, what I thought I would do, because we are in such an interdisciplinary setting, is just in the area of interpretability is such a new area when it comes to machine learning um, and the law and all of these areas, uh, is to spend a little bit of time just uh, laying out at least how I see the key terms, how the ecosystem fits together, um, and then spend a few moments giving my opinions um, and then uh, hand it over to Boris and then we'll we'll have a discussion after that. Um, so just in terms of key terms and like how I think about this, um, there's a box. It may be a black box. It might be a white box. Um, this is your AI. Um, there was some training data that went into it. Um, there was also some training loss that was used to train it, the training loss. Um, these produce the AI that, that we have. And when we're using that AI, some input goes into that AI. Maybe it's a voice recording. Um, and then there is some output, some, uh, some prediction, some decision. Uh, maybe this is the closed caption of the, of the record or the audio that was going in, something like that. Um, and then we have some sort of real world objective that we care about um, that we look at this uh, prediction in the context of and, and see whether it's doing well or not. Um, and then in the context of, uh, of interpretable AI or explainable AI, and I'll get to those um, uh, terms a little bit more closely, the way I think about this is that not only now is the model um, outputting the AI, not only is it outputting some prediction or a decision, it's outputting some other information. I'm gonna call that information the explanation. And there's a couple of different things, like the, the explanation could have different uses, right? So um, it has a, a purpose for whatever the user wants to do. It might be for, for providing insights about how the model works. It might be for providing oversight, which is I think the case that we're most interested in today. Um, and it may also have many different forms. Um, and the, the, this, the key distinction that I wanna make for the purposes of today's discussion are situations where the explanation, which we're gonna assume has to be like human interpretable, right? Like if you're giving information to a person, person can't understand it and somehow the explanation is already a failure, right? Um, well, it could just be the model. So it could be the model itself. And I'm gonna call this, um, and in the community, I think there is increasing convergence around the term like inherently interpretable. So maybe this is a decision tree. Um, in my lab, we work on much more sophisticated models that are still fully inspectable by humans. Maybe it takes like half an hour, an hour, um, half a day to look at for a clinician, but that's, that's okay, right? Because uh, if you're gonna put a system out into the real world, you, know, you can spend some time looking at it beforehand ex ante. Um, so there, there are many options here. I want to emphasize that there's a lot of options here. And then there are situations in which you cannot present the entire model, right? Um, and in this case, you have to give a partial view of the model. For example, you might try to say that, hey, uh, it's the three factors that were most important for this input. Um, the reason why the loan was declared Declined was these three factors for this particular person. Um, and you're not presenting the entire model. Uh, you're just presenting a partial view because not only are you presenting it for just that one person, but you're also only presenting you know, the key factors. You're not describing necessarily even how they relate to each other. Um, and so before I continue, um, because I, I think we're gonna spend a long time in the discussion talking about debating like what can be done with these partial views, uh, which are necessarily not the entire model. I just want to make a quick note of like, why? Why would we settle for a partial view? Um, and my argument is gonna be that many times we shouldn't. If it's a high stakes scenario, um, we need to make sure that certain procedures were followed. Um, we may not be able to do so um, with just a partial view. 
But in terms of today, like why do people end up using partial views? And I will say that there are um, maybe three main reasons, right? Um, there are certain domains um, where these models just need to be more complicated. Uh, for example, with images or waveforms, where saying that this pixel is a key pixel, it doesn't even make sense, right? Why work with codified healthcare data? In codified healthcare data, you can say, uh, the reason is because uh, you know if a patient has this many of this type of code, they probably have depression, right? And you can understand what it means to have this many of this type of code. Um, whereas to say that, well, this pixel was at this value, it's not really inherent, like the, the input itself is not inherently interpretable. So to make a partial view, or sorry, to make a model that's inherently interpretable is very difficult. Um, and you end up taking a partial view to look at that. So there, there might be certain domains, uh, for example, like images and waveforms. Um, you may have a complex system. So if you have many models interacting with each other, um, it may be really hard to back things out. And I think this is also a really important distinction. Uh, for example, an algorithm that is used for pretrial risk assessments um, that takes in a, you know, even 100 variables and outputs a recommendation, that is not a complicated algorithm, right? That is not a complicated system. But if you have lots of different like ad models and like models and blah, 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 floating around in some social media ecosystem, um, maybe those are a little bit harder uh, to disentangle. I'm not saying that uh, one uh, cannot and one should not or what, what the circumstances are, but just practically speaking, that's a harder situation. Um, and finally, I, I will say just convenience, right? This is maybe the bucket that we want to avoid um, because it's often easier to train a black box model back here that's not inherently interpretable and simply provide a partial view of the model afterwards. So this is my view of, you know, interpretable machine learning and, and notice that I'm using interpretable machine learning to refer to this process. Um, I'm using the word explanation to refer to the thing that comes out, which could be the model itself um, and could be a partial view. Um, so how does this fit in with the accountability ecosystem? So how does this fit in with accountability? With accountability. And here again, before, we're going to spend most of this session uh, diving into some really specifics when it comes to algorithms and explanation. But I want to make sure we have a slightly bigger picture before we zoom in to the more narrow view, um, because we don't want to leave uh, other techniques that are out there off the table. And the way I'm going to do this is that I want to put down some types of goals we might have and some types of tools um, that we might have available. So one type of goal that we might want to ask is, you know, is it safe? You know, is the model that we've created safe? If we're going to be recommending dosages uh, for patients in intensive care units for different types of treatments, really important to know whether that model is, is safe or not. Um, and if you know, for example, that there are dosages that are just lethal or ranges that you just should not fall out of, um, you can build that in. Right, so I'm going to put uh, one type of tool as a guarantee or a proof. Right, in certain situations, you may be able to just say, you know, I know this. Uh, you know, I have built the system, so it cannot screw up. Not always, but that's one tool that you have at your disposal. Um, you may also have some empirical evidence. Right, how well is it doing in the real world? Um, and then we could have transparency around how the model was trained about like, let's say put down about the data and the objective. And then finally, I'm gonna put in this explanation category over here. Um, and all of these things may be helpful. Um, maybe if you've only trained your autonomous car in sunny areas, um, you might say, oh, I, I, I just looking at the data, I'm not sure if it's going to be safe in the snow, for example. Other types of questions that you might ask um, ha may have to do with performance, right? They might be about like, how accurate is it? Um, and how accurate is it for certain, for, for across different subgroups? 
of your population. And this is largely an empirical question, right? It's something that you could gather information about and be able to tell either from the training data, or not either, both from the training data and um, you know, once the system is out there um, through surveillance of the system, how well it's doing, right? And no explanation really is needed for that particular case. Um, you might wanna know what was it optimized for or is it optimizing things that I want? Um, if you have a, a social media website, um, you know, how are those content recommendations being made? Is it somehow in my interest or according to my wants or some other thing? I just want to know, right? So there, that's a place where something like transparency ends up being really important. Um, and then the final one, which is the one that we're going to be spending most of the time talking about, um, is, uh, I, I think, um, is, you know, were processes followed? Um, and, and then I'm going to put other things there also about like, um, what could I do to change a decision? And other similar types of questions. And here is the place where folks have turned to something like explanation. Because if you look at, you might be able to guarantee this in certain cases by construction in the model. So we shouldn't leave that out. Um, we can look at empirical evidence, but we may not be sure, right? Just because the data seem consistent with something that followed a process that we think is appropriate, um, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that that process was followed. Um, and knowing about the data and the objective doesn't either, right? The, this question of like, how would I change a decision? What were the processes that are followed inherently require some understanding of the model itself, like some insight into the way the model itself works. And that's um, where I see explanation really being important in this ecosystem of different tools to get to accountability. And I just wanna say that um, or emphasize that because explanation is generally, is often useful for lots of different things. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, many times the empirical evidence is also extremely useful or transparency about the data may actually be way more important or insightful um, than an explanation of the, of the model over here. Um, cool, so that's the ecosystem. Um, and then getting to our main question. which is basically like, what can explanations do for us? And are they good enough? So working in interpretability is one of my research areas currently. And here's kind of where I believe the state of things are um, at the moment. So if you want to, if you have a simple enough setting, so one of these settings um, where you can do the inherent interpretable models. We're getting pretty good at building them and better and better. There's a lot of really great work um, to create these inherently interpretable models. So um, maybe this question can be broken actually into two subparts. So if we have an inherently interpretable model, would we know that processes are followed? And I think this is a question that almost certainly has an answer in the affirmative, but is not trivial. Because one thing that people like me don't know, but are very curious about and I'm excited for this conversation is what are the details of the actual processes in these different cases where um, you know these rationales need to be provided for decision making? And so the way I typically think about this is that, well, I'm just going to tell you exactly how the input becomes the output, right? And hopefully that's enough for you to you know infer whatever else and 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 uh, determine whether 
this was done according to whatever criteria you needed it to have done or in the healthcare setting, make sure that we are not making some crazy recommendation. Uh, but it, I don't think that it's always trivial to map um, uh, some uh, legal definition of you know, what is appropriate process to this flow chart. Let's assume that you can think of these inherently interpretable algorithms as some type of flow chart. Um, but if we can, um, then I think the answer is, is yes, right, um, to, to this sort of question. So then we get to the question about what about partial views? Right, these um, so-called explanations of black box models that don't tell you everything that is going on inside the model. Um, so let me actually make a note. So I'll say yes, um, but we will need uh, more precise, probably we will need more precise descriptions of what appropriate process means. Um, so then we get to partial views. And I think that that is way more difficult. Um, even in the setting where you don't have necessarily a process that you're trying to verify. Um, but let's say you're just trying to verify whether a certain feature was used in making a decision. Because you can think of the, the, the partial view um, you know, as a, you know, having a very limited probe, right? A, a, it, the, the model is vast and you take a very small snapshot of the model. Um, and if you take the snapshot right here, you might be sitting on a mountain, but that little part of the model just happens to be flat. Um, and if you are in an adversarial setting, maybe someone has created this mountain of lots of little flat pieces. So almost everywhere where you take a look at the model, it's always gonna look flat, um, even though you know it's some ginormous hill. Um, that the model uh, is, you know, that the model surface looks like. So I, I feel a lot less optimistic about how to get any sort of guarantee out of a partial view uh, to say that, yes, for sure, um, this process was followed. Um, but maybe there are certain cases um, where, where this is possible. And I'll give just like an example. So around a particular point, we might be able to say that, uh, so overall, I think this is gonna be really hard, um, uh, especially um, in adversarial settings. And, and maybe actually before I go to the, the point of like how we might do it, let, let me also point out that ad, ad, there's adversarial settings and then there's like well-intentioned machine learning models um, doing things that you don't want. So I just gave the example um, that if you have a function that looks kind of like this um, and you wanted to know whether it is sensitive um, to uh, the x-axis, right? Like if I move along the x-axis, does it make a difference? Well, most of the points that you sample, the answer is gonna be no, right? Wherever I check, it looks flat, it, like it's fine, right? It's not sensitive to this sensitive attribute that you know, I'm putting on the bottom axis. But um, uh, if you just told the model, hey, I, I don't want you to be sensitive to X, right? Don't do anything adversarial, I'm not, or, or not, you know, I'm not telling you to do something funky. I'm just telling you, don't be sensitive to X and go, go off and learn something. It could it quite innocently learn this function, right? If you have a highly expressive model. Um, so I'm gonna say in adversarial settings um, and um, joint, uh, kind of joint learning settings. So this is really hard um, in general to get models to not do uh, you know funky stuff. Uh, but maybe there are some options. Um, for example, if you learn an inherently interpretable model around a, a particular point, um, and then you could interpret that or something like that. But uh, I do think it's going to be very hard um, when you have partial views to be able to kind of back out this sort of process. Um, well enough or with high enough fidelity to be able to uh, make decisions here. Uh, but I will definitely be excited for the discussion on that. So I will leave this here. Um, excited to hear from Boris um, and continue.
continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this presentation. And I'm, I'm going to turn uh, right away to our second presenter. Uh, I'll be particularly interested also in the conversation to explore some of the policy implications of this uh, uh, and how to kind of um, inform some of the discussions that are happening in terms of governance models for, for different uh, types of, of models that you described. So just turning directly to, uh, to uh, Professor uh, Babitz uh, for, for his presentation. Thank you, Philippe Andre, for the introduction, and and also thank you, Finale, for uh, for for your contribution. I I, sh I should say in advance, I'm speaking from a hotel room in Singapore where it's 1:15 in the morning right now. So if I stop making sense at some point, that yeah, no, that, that that is my excuse. Um, okay, so uh, my little uh, pitch here, which will be a little bit more of an editorializing pitch, is called the explainability bait and switch, and I will. Uh, so Finale's framing was really useful. I will basically just make the case or try to make the case against the value of doing explanations in the form of what Finale called a uh, partial view model explanations. Um, to, map, uh, to map some of the terminology we have in these slides with Finale's framing. So I, I've used the term explanation for partial view model explanations. And then I've just used the term interpretation for uh, for inherently interpretable models. Um, so that's sort of uh, that's that's the that's the mapping and terminology. Um, so three parts here: why explain algorithms again in that sense of uh, partial uh, partial explanation models, partial view models. Um, part two: how to explain algorithms. And part three, what uh, what we want to say is wrong with with explaining algorithms, um, or what the limits of that are. Uh, a little bit of a background, a little bit of a background of sort of where this project is right now. So, with the co-authors that I had in the first slide, we published this short, short little paper, which was like a kind of pitch against the value of doing explainable machine learning. And then, since then, uh, one of the co-authors, Glenn Cohen, and I have been trying to sort of articulate in a little bit more detail why exactly uh, partial model explanations are not, uh, are not valuable um, from a policy or legal perspective. Uh, okay, so what, what, does the, what does the propaganda say? Um, so these are typically um, the kind of rationales that are given in terms of, in, in, in support of um, doing explainable AI, that, that it's gonna increase trust, it's gonna increase understanding, it's gonna increase uh, transparency, um, and somehow it's going to help us reduce uh, biases and discrimination. Um, okay, so some other benefits. Um, somehow, uh, you know, generating these explanations is going to support uh, democratic processes where the predictions are made in public context. Uh, somehow, this should dovetail with procedural justice, for example, clarify liability, such as who's responsible when something goes wrong. Um, somehow, it should also support substantive justice, which is to say, maybe reduce discrimination bias, make the predictions or decisions more fair. Though it remains to be seen uh, how. Okay, um, so now um, the how to explain algorithms. Uh, this is going to cover much of what Finale uh, developed in the in the framing. So I guess I just want, I guess I would just do a little bit to 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 make the similar distinction um, between the interpretability paradigm. In other words, the, the inherent interpretable models and the explainability paradigm, uh, the partial view models. Um, so just to kind of like clarify and to make sure that we're on the same page for how the explainability models work, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this. So suppose we have um, a black box and finally drew a black box for us. So that's, that's the box, um, which uses some data to estimate a function. And we will then make predictions um, let's call them Y hat black box uh, on the basis of X. So what, what the interpretability paradigm says is let's replace that black box with a white box and let's then feed the data to estimate a different function, let's say G, using that black white box model, which we use to make our predictions. We can call those Y hat white box. 
and we'll just never use the black box black box again. So the, the interpretability paradigm is pretty simple. If you if you're worried about black boxes, don't use black boxes. Um, it's open, it's transparent, it can be understood, um, mostly. Uh, Finale also gave some sort of limits on maybe it can take a while to understand it. The models can still get a little bit complicated, but for the most part, the assumption is that maybe we have a, a linear model with some modest number of uh, features, or maybe we have a decision tree, but something that someone can mostly kind of take some time to study and understand. And typically the, the, the features combine in an additive way to lead to the prediction. So we can say, okay, we're using this with this amount of weight and this with this amount of weight. You know, we're using your LSAT score and your GPA and equal weights to predict whether, you know, how well you would do in law school or something. Uh, the explainability paradigm basically does the following. So now um, we identify a white box which tracks as closely as possible the predictions of the black box. This is now some, some function, let's say H, which we then use to predict uh, basically the predictions of the black box. We, we fit it to the predictions of the black box, the, the Y hat BBs. We then say that the white box explains the black box by producing to the user of this output, consumers, doctor, patients, uh, both the black box function and the white box function and the white box approximation to it, I should say. So the black box conti continues to be used for predictions and the white box which approximates it is used for explaining those predictions. And they work in tandem. You, you, you kind of have to use them together. Um, so the arguments to follow will be directed at this kind of paradigm, the, the partial model view or what I've been calling the explainability paradigm. And a, a kind of leading example of this kind of approach is this LIME algorithm, um, which stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. And what the LIME algorithm does is that it fits a linear approximation to, uh, to almost any black box model. Um, uh, so sort of assuming here that a linear model would be inherently interpretable. Um, so on the kind of why, why explain if one can interpret? Um, why even do this? Because uh, at, le at least to me, coming into this project at first, um, before I sort of knew anything, what's happening in this uh, XAI field that, that, that people call it, I was a little bit confused to learn that this is what, 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 what is called an, ex an explanation. Um, it, it, it's sort of an after the fact approximation. Um, so kind of first question is like, now that you drew this distinction, why would you ever want to do explain explainability if you can just throw the black box out and use a white box? Um, so, you know, one, one, one thing I want to suggest is actually insofar as we can just use inherently interpretable models, uh, we, we, we should. Um, now, but as a policy matter, if one were to say, you know, you, you have to, you have to use interpretable models, that would be, I mean, that would be quite limiting. It, it, it would be like saying whether it's an FDA or some regulatory body, it's basically saying like any of the models that everybody likes these days, any deep learning model you can't really use. Um, when it comes to, for instance, like uh, AI-based medical devices that the FDA has approved, essentially 100% of them use some kind of like deep learning model that, that, that would constitute a black box here on, on our working definitions. Um, so kind of mandating that, that one use interpretable models um, would be quite restrictive. There is also a dogma, um, not, not entirely a dogma, I guess there is some, some sort of sense to it, but that there is a trade-off between um, accuracy and interpretability. So that if you do force someone to use an interpretable model, there may be a loss in accuracy. I think Finale um, also uh, sort of cast a little bit of doubt on that by pointing out that interpretable models are increasingly better. And if there is this trade-off, it seems to be um, vanishingly small. Um, from a kind of conceptual perspective, it stands to reason if, you know, if interpretable models are a proper subset of all models, then I guess if you mandate that we use a model from that proper subset, 
uh, it stands to reason that there would be contexts where there, there would be some um, classification accuracy loss. So um, people still use people still use black box models quite a lot. And for the same reason, um, this kind of partial view or explainability paradigm tends to be pretty influential. So what's wrong with this paradigm or why, you know, why, why we think it's not as valuable as it's made out to be? Um, so generally, when, when we talk about understanding something, what we're interested in is capturing the why between a system's input and output. Um, in law, especially, we're particularly interested in understanding an agent's predicate intent for an act because knowing why they did what they did often determines whether and to what extent they should be punished. Um, explainable machine learning models are, are unable to, generally unable, we want to say, to contribute to our understanding of the black box uh, in this sense. Uh, because what they are providing is, is post hoc rationales of the black box predictions and post hoc rationales, which further are, are not unique. Um, so the, the, the analogy I want to give uh, to kind of motivate this uh, fool's gold argument here is, is the following. Suppose that one morning we have a, suppose that one morning we have a judge or a parole board officer who has to make uh, a sequence of parole decisions. And the judge makes those decisions. And uh, now one of the defendants who is denied parole asks the judge's clerk, uh, why was I denied parole? Now the judge's clerk uh, looks at the data of that morning and happens to see that um, in, this, in this prison, all the, all the prisoners have orange or yellow t-shirts. And all the, all the defendants who were denied parole had orange t-shirts that morning. So the judge's clerk comes back to defendant and reports uh, one reason why you might have been denied parole, uh, or maybe they don't even preface it that way. You were denied parole because uh, you wore an orange t-shirt. Um, the because is tenuous there, but um, the after the fact rationale is the part that I want to highlight. We wouldn't call that much of an explanation because what we've done is to kind of um, fit a rationale uh, to the particular data that we have. And what the, for instance, what the Lyme algorithm does is something very similar. We have the black box, which generates some function and some classification boundary. And then we fit a linear model after the fact to, to that classification boundary that approximates it in some neighborhood. Um, so that's 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 so one 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 argument here is that this is sort of not a particularly helpful explanation from from a legal or moral or policy perspective, um, given that it's a kind of post hoc rationale. Uh, a second point is that it's unstable as 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 new data comes in, that classification boundary will change, and likewise when we fit. Uh, when we fit the Lyme algorithm to, to, to the updated model, we would have a new approximation, which may be different from the approximation we gave to someone else. Um, one, one way to, to, to motivate this also visually is, so suppose that um, here's a kind of situation. In this instance, we have a black box models estimated function represented by the black curve here that, that sort of tracks this blue green boundary. The, uh, so the solid red line is, let's say, one linear approximation used to generate explanations for inputs where it's close to the black curve. The dashed red line is another linear approximation in close vicinity used to generate explanations for other inputs nearby. While both are locally faithful in the region where they're approximately tangent to the black curve, that large difference in slope between them means that the explanations can vary quite a bit for similar inputs. Uh, it also means that for a very small change in input, the white box can produce very different and possibly competing explanations. Um, the other, so the sort of related issue when it comes to these kinds of explanations is that they're by nature, um, let's say, insincere. And one can see that from like the, the little kind of um, jail and parole metaphor that, that, that I gave. Um, 
But so now I'll consider some kind of potential ob ob objections here. Um, but in many areas of law, we, we also provide what might be called insincere or after the fact rationales. You might say, well, what's, you know, what, what, what is so new about these post hoc rationales in the form of uh, algorithmic explanations? For instance, an appellate court looks at a trial court's decision and considers whether there's a reasonable ground for deciding the way they did. The appellate court doesn't try to look into the minds of the trial judges. Likewise, a review board maybe looks at a police officer's behavior and asks whether there's a reasonable basis for their potentially biased or racist behavior, but they don't try to look into the minds of the police officer. So uh, you might object, what's wrong with this kind of uh, insincerity? So one way to distinguish ordinary legal insincerity from algorithmic insincerity is that in ordinary cases, we engage in this kind of insincerity because that's kind of the nature of the task. We ask, is there a reasonable basis for the behavior? But we're not, we're not marketing the exercise as an offer of an explanation. Uh, we're just asking, did, did, did the officer act reasonably? Did the trial court um, have a reasonable basis for, for the decision that they found, that they found, that they made? And there's little worry of anyone understanding the rationales as mechanistic explanations of what's going on in the, in the judge's head, so to speak. We, we know that that's not what the appellate court is doing. And we know that the review board can't get into the judge's head. Uh, but in the, in the explainability paradigm, um, as sort of my little propaganda intro picture suggests, Insincerity is built in by design and into the marketing, and the rationale is presented at sort of improving our understanding of how the algorithm is working. So I think the problem with insincerity here is that, and maybe this is just a sort of like communication shortcoming, that these explainability models or partial, partial view models, um, they are consistently marketed as helping to improve our understanding of the black box, which carries with it a connotation that we're kind of going to open up the black box and understand what's happening in the model. And that's not really what they deliver. Um, likewise, this, this post hoc nature of the explanations undermines what might be the main benefit of explanations in other domains, namely their ability to guide subsequent behavior. So using the law school example, if we, if we fit an explanation after the fact, we tell someone, here's why you might have been rejected from the law school, um, it, it is due to your low LSAT score. That's not to say that the next time this student applies to the law school, uh, a, high, a higher LSAT score, you know, that this year would have, that, that, that fit to this data would have gotten her admitted, will get her admitted, because it could be something else that's, that's driving the explanation um, next year. Um, so this instability property also means that the explanations are not particularly action guiding. Um, what should we do instead? Uh, so last point here, I think um, we, we place too much value on mechanistic explanations when it comes to garnering trust. So a helpful example is the case of prescription drugs. Uh, most of us trust our doctor or the institution enough, the medical institution, such that when we're prescribed, uh, when we're given a prescription, uh, you know, we, we will take it, even though we don't understand the biochemical pathway by which drugs work. And this is a case where we entirely trust the black box um, for the most part. And the reason we trust the black box is because of... Um, the other regulatory processes that are in place. Not, we're not so much sort of obsessing or fetishizing, trying to, uh, trying to provide an explanation to everyone so that you know exactly how the drug works. It's more like, here's why you should be okay with taking this drug, knowing everything about how it was tested, uh, regulated, developed, approved, and so forth. And so you should feel comfortable knowing that it's safe, even though you don't really know how it works. And I think that might be a better um, analog for garnering trust in, in the algorithmic context. Okay, that's it for me. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for to both of you for those presentations. We have a little bit less than 30 minutes for, for questions and answers. Um, I, I actually see there's always uh, already someone with a uh, hand up. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the room first before asking any questions uh, myself. So uh, I see uh, Nicholas, uh, you have your, your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for, for the great uh, talks. I'm wondering sort of what the next steps are in, in this case. Is it, am I interpreting correctly that you're suggesting that then that rather than trying to explain the predictions of the model to show, for instance, to the, to the end user that the prediction was fair, we should instead try to enable, for instance, regulators to verify that the training process itself was uh, such that it preserves fairness. Is, is that sort of a, a good way to uh, understand sort of the, your conclusion, for instance, Boris? So um, I, I guess, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that, 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 that's not unfair. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't focus on fairness entirely. I think there are other reasons why we want to understand um, sort of that relationship between the input and the output, but um, you know, that's, that, that's certainly one of them. Yeah, I was just using that as a, as a simple example of sort of what we would want to use the explanation for. I was yeah. just curious if I understood. Your yeah, idea. I think I would also agree that there are certain things that the empirical evidence of, you know, is it producing biased outputs for different populations or was the training process gives information. Um, the two things that I wanted to add also were that um, I, I do think that there are certain situations in which we can demand inherently interpretable models, uh, it, like those FDA algorithms. I. I believe that all of those black boxes operate on images or waveforms or almost all of them, which is very hard to build inherently interpretable models for, um, but there might be other regimes, right? Uh, in, in criminal justice or lending or these uh, admissions decisions, which are really not so difficult in terms of dimensionality and all of that, where you could just have the inherently interpretable model. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to add is that I don't think we just need to throw out explanation entirely, the post hoc ex explanation entirely, because maybe one glue, uh, one key word that is really important when it comes to these uh, post hoc explanations is the properties that they have. So, for example, you could demand that the explanation has the property that if it says that, you know, increasing your LSAT score would get you admitted you go off and you increase your LSAT score, it would flip the boundary or you know, in a loan decision, if you had this much more money in the bank. Um, so it's a partial view, it's never gonna show you everything, um, but we can make demands of the properties of that statistic. Like I think of an, a, a, the explanation almost as a statistic of the model. Um, and, and just like we can, any statistic has, has properties, you know, these explanations have properties as well. It makes complete sense. Thank you both for the for the great talks and the insight the insights. Thank you. I think um, so. One one thing I'll one thing I'll add to to Finale's first model, um, where where inter where we can kind of make demands to have interpretable models. One one potentially helpful distinction might be between sort of pure predictive or diagnostic context, and another one be and on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, contexts that involve sort of allocation under, under conditions of scarcity. So when it comes to um, who's going to get uh, a, a, a kidney transplant from a limited number of kidneys, that might be a case where particularly you want an interpretable model and you want to know exactly on what basis the allocation is being made. Uh, whereas if, if it's just a risk prediction for a certain disease, uh, what might be of most interest is just like let you know for it to be as accurate as possible. I think that's an interesting point. I, I do just I just because we're having a discussion. Um, I, I think the form of the data again, as I said at the beginning, is going to matter a lot. For example, in that kidney um, case, what if it turned out that a scan of the patient's kidney was super important for that particular decision? 
my guess is that it's going to be very hard to make something inherently interpretable, um, it, you know, based off of you know the the MRI or such. Uh, there's there's feature finding and stuff like that. So, um, and then would we say that oh you're not allowed to use the MRI if it somehow produces be better kidney matching? It, it, it's a I, I don't have answers. It's a difficult question. That's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, if 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 it somehow produces better matching and you cannot. Um, and you cannot because I can imagine the old, let's say the old system, you know, what it only required some patient lab values and stuff like this, and, and then then you built your inherently interpretable model. But now suddenly someone realizes that oh, this image data makes a huge difference. Yeah, there may be a real cost in that case to to kind of um, pr the procedural benefits of inher inherently interpretable models. Um, there is a question from Gillian uh, uh, who would like to hear Boris's thought about Fanala's proposal that maybe we need to pull from law a better understanding of the correct process for a decision and then test for that. I'll let you read. I know it's it's uh, middle of the night for you. No, uh, well, well, um, I mean, I don't have anything particular particularly insightful right now what would be the the you know the correct process that we can draw an analog from from law and test for um i mean i don't have i don't have great thoughts on this it's a it's a great question i just don't have a good answer maybe an area for, for future uh, research. One question or one topic I, I wanted to come back to, uh, because I think it's it's something I, I see in, in my work is really what you call the, uh, Boris, the propaganda machine of, of industry towards XAI. Um, and uh, I mean, we see, you know, this kind of principle really be becoming baked in a lot of these kind of normative processes internationally and, and, and domestically and regionally. Is there a sense of, First of all, why is this push like what what is this propaganda machine trying to accomplish uh, from what you're seeing from your standpoint? And then um, how can these processes kind of react or readjust uh, to this overemphasis on, on explainability? I, you gave a little bit of a, a beginning of a, of, of a solution uh, and obviously recognizing what Finala said, we're not trying to necessarily completely uh, evacuate explanation, but this kind of uh, overemphasis that's being discussed. What what can we, we do? What can be done about that? So I mean, on the on the why, this is going to be a little bit speculative, no doubt. Um, but you know, one one thing that I think at least plays a partial role is the sort of um, you know when when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail sort of approach because. Um, you know, these kinds of explanations, like, like that Lyme algorithm, I mean, the idea is like, well, look, now we can operationalize this. Okay, we want to fit an approximation to the black box. And, you know, we can formulate it, there's some there, there's some distance function, there's some distance measure between the input points. Um, there's an optimization problem to solve, there are some constraints, uh, you know, this is something we can do. Um, so I think that certainly drives some of the enthusiasm and some of the enthusiasm against inherently interpretable models was that they were kind of limiting, right? People want to do fancy deep learning stuff. And now if you say, no, you have to use classification trees, um, simple classification trees, that 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 rules out a lot. So th this is both kind of like something that can be operationalized and something that plays really well with what others want to do, which is to use what are perceived to be the most exciting models. But, but it is again, um, kind of speculative. If, if I might add a little bit to that, again, speculative, but um, it, I, I would go back to partly also convenience. You know, these, these deep learning pipelines are just way easier to use than training these models. Um, but I think there's also a, a bit of a, a trade secret black box thing going on as well where one if you because if, if it's an inherently interpretable model and you build it then now everyone has it right um once it's out there and maybe some paradigms of like when you uh when you sell someone the model you are also selling us 
service to do the post market surveillance on the model. I'm just making stuff up. You know, maybe there needs to be a change in like how these things are valued um, so that people don't feel like, oh, as soon as I create the model, it's all the value is gone. Anyone else can use it. That's a, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. Like on, on sort of another reason why a model can be a black box is just because it's like a trade secret, which, which is kind of like a boring reason. It's like, we won't, we won't reveal it to you, but it's actually quite common in most like industry applications. This is the reason, not that it's some like, not, not necessarily that uh, some super fancy model is just not public. Um, and you're right, then in that case, the XAI model fits really well with that because we can approximate the predictions of anything, whether it's a trade secret or whether it's a fancy model or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think, you know, the fact that uh, industry is enabling this uh, kind of, you know, narrative in, in, in both government and in civil society also creates a bit of a market for academics to do some, some research on this uh, and enables them to actually do that work and, and have access to industry in ways that potentially other kinds of models that you, you refer to something that's more akin to maybe due diligence or um, a little bit more kind of forceful can do. And my sense is also there's so much writing or there's a sense or a perception that so much of economic growth uh, is, is supposed to be driven through uh, digital tech that anything that would hinder innovation um, is, is, is seen as, as potentially negative. So anyways, right. uh, probably an, another conversation to have, but uh, just uh, interesting to think about how you know, economic factors probably also enable XAI as a field uh, and some of these kind of overemphases. Um, and just to return to potentially my, my, the other part of my question, unless there's a, another question, I'm just going to look very quickly. I don't see any. Um, what to do about this? How do we actually kind of go about this overemphasis? What, what should we, we do as, as policymakers um, in terms also of academic uh, organizations and academic research agendas? How do we kind of readjust uh, how we go about, uh, about XAI in general? So I think from a policy perspective, if if there is a high level of risk involved or a societal harm, actually I was skimming the the Canadian directive on AI recently, um, you know, and there's these various categories. I thought that was really nicely formulated. And so if you have these really key situations, I think either you require an inherently interpretable model or you have to have very good reason um you know really strong empirical evidence um showing that across the range and because again the thing that i think an empirical evidence is not going to get you is this form of procedural legitimacy so somehow you have to be able to say that i'm okay just saying that hey it just seems to work um and, and that's good enough for for and, and maybe that bar then is particularly high it has to work really well across lots of subgroups so maybe you don't have doubts um, and then the other cases, um, you know, maybe it's just not just I mean, content recommendation, you know, sways millions of people and minds, so it's not to say it's low risk or something, um, but there might be other cases where you're happy with some level of explanation with guarantees. And maybe also um, to separate out uh, I think one thing that's important is it the model's fault or is it the explanation's fault? You know, like if you, if the model has a bias in it, um, or the model changes, or the model says that yellow shirts, um, you know, don't get parole today or whatever, that's the model's fault, right? It's not the explanation's fault. Um, and we need to know, right? Like when you get information that is in the explanation, is it because the explanation might be telling you something incorrect? Is it because the model it may be at fault? And I, I think that if you're in this regime, unfortunately, right now, you probably need an expert auditor. So that would be my advice. You know that it's not a check in terms of these checklists, policy checklists. It's not something that uh, a company could or a, or, or a policymaker could just say, okay, you satisfied the checklist. Um, you probably need a third party expert to verify that this explanation was high enough quality for whatever you needed to do with it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with both of these suggestions. One being that, uh, you know, sometimes we may want to be more uh, aggressive in terms of requiring inherently explainable models. And this suggestion of having like an external auditor is kind of within what I envision with the prescription drugs example, because that would be the sort of the sort of institutional framework that develops that kind of trust that that we have in the, you know, in like, let's say the drugs analog. I was sort of thinking about this question that 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 finale raised earlier, and this is in connection with with Jillian's question, which I didn't have an answer to earlier of whether if we use an inherently interpretable model, will that kind of satisfy the legal process considerations. Um, and I, I, I don't really, I don't really know either. Um, intuitively also, yes, but I suppose there are things that we might still want to know that if you just present the model to someone wouldn't be immediately answered. Um, you know, we might have a situation where we have an inherently interpretable model. Uh, it turns out that some subset of features uh, happens to correlate very closely with a protective feature, which isn't in the model. So from immediately inspecting the model, I can tell race is not in the model, but I may not realize that some not self-evident subset of features actually correlates almost perfectly with race. Though it is something that I could, you know, again, through this expert auditor kind of approach, I could, I could test for, I could examine, uh, but it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be immediately evident. Example, you relying on race, the bot doesn't have that variable in there, and so you have to uh, tell just based on the, the basis of that model. Um, and I see Gillian as, as a follow up question. Uh, you can probably all see it, but does a valid justification for a model's decision have to be grounded in a true causal account or of what is happening in the model? I, I want to say yes. <laughs> like if, and, and I think causality with respect to a model is, is e relatively. You know, causality with respect to physics or something like that might be hard because you don't quite know the physics or whatever. But here, I think the assumption when we do explainable modeling is we have the model. We can put the inputs in. We can see how the outputs change. Uh, we can do all the interventions, you know, to get any sort of causal reasoning out of how that model works to our level of desire. So I, I'm or <laughs> finale, I guess I have a question. So, um, would would you say that you know where where would you put approaches like Lyme? Um, would you say they are even causal with respect to a model? So, I guess you know, on this notion of causal with respect to a model, I understand the idea as being like okay, we may not be able to develop a causal account of the underlying process, but we're actually here just trying to predict the predictor, so to speak. Um, but if it's just a linear approximation of the black box predictions, then arguably it's not even, a, it's not even causal with respect to the model, something like Lyme. Well, it's a partial, it's still a partial view. So it's not, maybe it's not expressive enough is where I would say the problem is coming in, that the, the linear approximation is only accurate within, a, you know, the model squiggly that the linear approximation is a very small regime where it's accurately reflecting the model. Uh, but in that regime, it is, or, or kind of, I'm trying to figure out what is the alternative, right? Like, would you ever output something that wasn't a, an approximation to what was causally happening in the model? And I, can't think of any situation where that would be the right, like a, that would be like a valid justification. Like it, you could require, require different levels of uh, quality of the justification, better, better partial views. I guess my, I guess my thought for why it might not be causal with respect to a model was that if it's so, I, I, but I guess you're right. If it's with respect to the model and with respect to some kind of 
subset of the feature space, then yeah, by hypothesis there, it's causal. But um, if I try to think about it as a kind of global causal explanation, then that may not be right because somewhere else where the function is very different, the approximation could look quite different. Right, and then you kind of need to know the bounds of where your yeah. um, explanation applies, which I think is, again, that, that sort of thing that I, I think people who are working in this field are getting a better sense of, like, we need to be more transparent about the properties. Oh, this thing is only valid in this region. It's, it's valid in this teeny tiny region right in that picture that you drew, for example. Right. Yeah. So, so then in, in response to Jillian's again, hard question of um, does the decision have to be grounded in a true causal account? Um, I mean, I guess one way, one way to opt for no here is if we, if we go in for the kind of approach the again, the prescription drugs analog where we take a broader view of the kinds of, those kinds of audits that, 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 that can kind of improve improve trust and reliability of a decision, they don't necessarily have to be grounded in a causal account. Um, there could be a lot of ways to kind of I think um, there could be ways to to audit the decision model that aren't that aren't necessarily grounded in requiring a causal account. Uh, absolutely. And I think that this is where again you could similarly say that I'm going to look at the quality of the outputs of the model. And then it's kind of like, you know, this drug seems to work, you know, this model seems to work. Um, I just think when you start to ex do explanation, if you're going down the route of explanation, it to me seems like an inherently causal discovery process about the model or the right way to do it again, because you are doing these interventions, right? You check, check, you can check all your different counterfactuals um, going in. Um, Andrew uh, has a question uh, or a comment uh, for reflection, I guess he's asking uh, and saying, I'm not really seeing anything here which would allow us to explain large language models, which is a problem. I'm not sure if uh, anyone wants to react to that. True. <laughs> or, or I think you can do the same sort of, I mean, you can find explanations. I think that language is another category where it's very hard to make anything inherently interpretable. You can try to see if changing certain words changes uh, or changing your prompt changes the output in certain ways. Um, you can look at various attention mechanisms, but they're all quite limited. I, feel like. I, I mean, I, I, I sort of tend to agree for the broader reason that I would tend to agree that um, the the explainability paradigm is limited. I don't quite know what happens when you apply something like Lime to large language models. I don't know what the output would look like. Or if you can. I, mean, I guess you should be able to, I just don't know if it would be meaningful. Um, I see Andrew just wrote. Uh, and I think actually oh, just. Go ahead. Oh, yes, I, I, okay, I agree with Andrew on the point that Lyme, just because the number of parameters is going to be difficult. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I agree that like attention models are limited. I, I, I think this is, I, I do think this is a big open question. I, I was just chatting with a colleague about this where it's a super large discrete space which makes it just very hard to understand what's going on when the output comes out. So how do you make sure your chatbot doesn't say inappropriate things is I think one of the, the hardest questions you know, in terms of different types of machine learning types of modeling uh, accountability questions. Andrew, I'm not sure if you wanted to uh, take the floor for a second just to uh, expand on, on, on your, uh, your, your comment. I can, I mean, I, 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 I would add a little bit though here, this is the, this is a helpful comment. Uh, I mean, in this sense, I could sort of add it to my laundry list of arguments against explainability. And I would frame this as, you know, uh, some, block, some black boxes may not even be meaningfully approximatable. Mm -hmm. I see, I see Andrew says he's, he's good. Uh, uh, with, with this, but uh, wondering whether this is an opportunity uh, 
and, and not just a problem. I'm not sure if, uh, if you would agree with that in terms of potential future research or, or anything like, like that. Um, I see we're at two minutes uh, to, to uh, time. Um, so I'll just take a, a second to uh, thank our two panelists uh, for their time uh, and for their great uh, explanation on explanation. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, Boris, for uh, waking up, I don't know if you even went to, to sleep actually, but for taking the time in the middle of the night to, to be with us um, in, in Canada. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Finale, for, for uh, the presentation. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more uh, work that needs to happen in terms of translating some of these insights, especially from our end in terms of policy work. Uh, when it comes to governance of AI and this kind of overemphasis. So uh, lots of food for thought and lots uh, to do on that front. So thank you so much for, for the great uh, panel presentations and uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll turn it back to, to you, Monique, for the invitation to moderate this panel. Thank you, everyone. That was another great discussion. And I, I think um, um, Andre, Philippe, wrapped it up well with saying lots of food for, for thought there. Um, at this time, we're gonna take a, a brief 15 minute break uh, before our, our final session of the day. So I just wanna encourage folks to, you know, stretch their legs, drink some water, um, get outside if you, you have a chance. And then when we come back at, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be joined by um, another panel that will be moderated by Sheila McElwraith and she'll be joined by Jennifer Nagel and Natasha Jakes, um, and they'll be discussing natural and artificial social learning. So see everybody back here at um, 2.15, actually I'm being told 2.15 p.m. Eastern time. So, so a quick break and see you back at 2.15, thanks. <laughs>